but their IQ is very much in normal range, therefore unimpaired, therefore n incomplete penetrance. Okay? And in our paper and in the subsequent work we've done, we're kind of challenging this idea of incomplete penetrance. Um, and one of the things that we talk about, and, and I haven't really introduced it yet because I didn't want to get too jargony. I've already done that enough probably. Um, but we sort of refer to all these other disorders as developmental brain disorders, which sounds like a catch-all generic term, and it is. And, and really it's meant to sort of capture what I had several slides back, which is that there's a whole lot of overlap. Same CNV uh, can, uh, can give a rise to different disorders. Uh, different disorders can stem from the same CNV. There's a whole lot of phenotypic uh, overlap and behavioral overlap in these disorders. So we sort of choose to say, call them something, you know, similar. And we know that in these CNVs and in the, in the developmental brain disorders that there's a huge phenotypic variability in terms of cognition, language, motor, social, uh, body mass. Some of these disorders are linked to obesity, head circumference. Some of them are linked to macrocephaly and microcephaly, et cetera. The question is what accounts for this variable expressivity of the CNVs? Why, for example, just going back, if, if this is the same CNV, why are we dealing with this pretty broad distribution still? And, and something that came up at lunch, if we know this CNV is there, why, and, and we also know that the standard deviation is 15 also, same as in the general population, why hasn't knowing the CNV reduced that variability? Why aren't these more homogeneous? Why isn't this thing really tight around them? We, after all, we know what the copy number variation is that's responsible for the, for the uh, decrement in IQ, and yet it's still 30. The answer to that sort of is if you look at studies on autism spectrum disorders, the distribution of IQ is 30. So in fact, we've, in fact, we've sort of we've reduced that back to normal, back to the general population, but that's, that's a bit of another. So one of the things that we're talking about in terms of thinking about how do you characterize, how do you identify psychiatric or neurodevelopmental morbidity is possibly looking at other, at, at relative background family to expected outcome. Essentially, what would the proband have likely been like if it weren't for that deletion or that duplication syndrome, all right? Um, and how do we do that is a bit of a a bit of a, uh, a challenge, but I'm going to propose something. Um, whole chromosome aneuploidy. So this is a girl with Turner syndrome, uh, missing a whole X chromosome. So in the sex chromosomes, instead of XX, there's X and a, and a deletion and a deletion. Generally, Turner's still a broad phenotype in, in cognitively and socially, um, but generally present uh, remarkably with short stature learning disabilities or intellectual disabilities as well as, a, as social deficits. However, we started to get into this work, I started to look at, at some older work that had been done, and this is, you know, 40 years old. But this was a cool study that I came across. These are Turner Syndrome probands as adults, and these are their biparental mean, the midparental height of each Turner Syndrome proband's parents. And so, Granted that Turner syndrome aneuploidy resulted in short stature, but still the degree of that shortness is highly correlated to the parental height. So other background family factors are still, um, are still expressing themselves to create some of this variable expressivity. All right, I, I'm sorry to blow the joke that I made to one person earlier, I forget, I'm sorry. But if Shaquille O'Neal had a daughter with Turner, she'd probably be like 5'8", right? <laughs> she'd be way shorter than you would expect given Shaq's daughter. But, and so, but there's still a shift from biparental mean, but it would still be correlated with family background. We see this too with prader willi syndrome. So this is the deletion 15Q11 uh, to 13, 15th chromosome. It's actually a really fascinating disorder. Again, the whole complement of compulsive behavior, intellectual disability, short stature, and obesity because of this, this uh, really uncompromising um, 
lack of satiation is what it is. Anyway, what we find is that relative to their parents, even as adults, the people with Prader Willi are one to two standard deviations shorter than their parents, but the parent proband correlation is still about 0.6 to 0.7. All right? It's still, there's still a role for parental background. Body mass index is about three standard deviations above where their parents are, and yet it's somehow still linked. The idea being that other family background, and I may say genetic issues, are contributing to that variable expressivity. Okay. Okay. So instead of measuring the impact of V relative, this is sort of stating what I've been stating, to absolute thresholds, we ought to consider relative affected family members. In our work, we've said, okay, it's been established in just a couple of studies that this works for height and it works for body mass. What about this concept of the shift from parental mean in, in other quantitative traits like cognitive ability, social ability, social responsiveness, motor ability, and, and any other behavioral traits, including the whole complement of, of schizophrenia spectrum, uh, ADHD spectrum, ASD, whatever you want. And we are part of a group um, that's funded by the Simon, that's basically the Simon Foundation. Um, and, and they are focusing on several copy number variations, and one of their main ones is this 16P11.2 deletion syndrome that I talked about. And these are some pictures of people longitudinally, I think. Some of them are the same kid. Yeah, it's the same kid at three time points or two time points. Um, Here's this deletion. This is considered a small deletion by some standards. It's a micro deletion. This is the, the uh, 600 uh, kilobase pairs long. So this is a cartoon of the chromosome. This is the region, the 16P region that's deleted. And this is that region sort of exploded. There were 29 genes in that area. Okay? So we're not, there are certainly single gene mutations that are associated with ASD. We're looking at copy number variations that may include you know, many more genes in a region. That's, that's 16P. It's a greatly heterogeneous clinical presentation, but it's a high risk for autism, 25-fold what you'd expect in the general population, 75% no autism, so think, huh, incomplete penetrance maybe. Intellectual disability and developmental delay, about 23%. Higher rates of developmental coordination disorder, and and higher rates of obesity, okay? Also, when you do large population studies, and there have been a couple of them in, um, in Iceland, in Ryan Stephenson's uh, large Icelandic cohort, where he basically genotyped a third of the Icelandic sample, he recognized that there were uh, several 16P112 deletion syndrome carriers in the general population that had never been uh, referred for clinical work. That is, uh, that is they appeared somewhat normal. They, they just, they had gone through some psychiatric testing and everything was uh, sort of checked out. So it's there, unaffected, and we can say, well, there's incomplete penetrance then of 16P. Um, what I'm going to say, so also I should say that we limited our study to de novo cases. Um, there's some important reasons for we genotyped, the parents were also genotyped, and we confirmed that the parents did not have the 16P11 deletion syndrome. Several reasons to do that, right? Um, one of them is that when a parent is a carrier, even if they're apparently unaffected or very mildly affected, there's a sortative mating that takes place, and that reduces the variability considerably. And so we were interested in de novo cases where the parents did not have this deletion, but the proband or the offspring did, okay? Non-carrier siblings and... Sorry, I'm gonna tell you. We, so everyone was genotyped. They all got um, an IQ test, looking at full scale and verbal and nonverbal IQ. We administered a quantitative trait that's, that's used widely in ASD research to look at social responsiveness. This is John Constantino's measure, psychometrically really, really sound. We looked at vulnerability with the Purdue pegboard task, and we, we looked at body mass index. And so what we're interested in is, again, the shift. And so what you see here, this is with full-scale IQ. 
So this is the distribution. The mean IQ of the uh, pro band 16 peak bands was about, I think it was 84 or 85, right around there. So my them reach diagnostic criteria for intellectual disability. The majority of them are actually ab above that threshold. But you see here, these are the parents by parental mean IQ. Those are the siblings. And we see in general this, this massive shift to the left to lower IQ. But what we also see is a significant intra-class correlation between proband and biparental mean of 0.42. It's actually higher when we look at the verbal scale than the non-verbal scale. Okay, but it's statistically significant. When we look at the social responsiveness scale, shifts to the right indicate uh, more symptoms or greater, uh, you know, lesser degrees of social responsiveness. And again, we see a shift of 2.2 standard deviations. Now, the cutoff, these are raw scores, not T scores, and there's a reason we did that, and I could explain. Um, um, but there's a shift that would indicate that some of these kids are clearly in the, eight, in the symptomatic range, and some are in the very low range. But the correlation, nonetheless, was still really with biparental mean on social responsiveness. All right, you're starting to get, obviously, the theme here. We found the same for motor ability, a shift in motor skills in the Purdue pegboard task, although the, the correlation was less in this group. And just siblings, we find a shift of one standard deviation in body mass index from siblings, but a correlation of 0.4 with the siblings. Ordinarily, scores are on the x-axis. Sometimes yeah. you manage to put the scores on the curve. Yeah. Why, why do you do that? Yeah, very what good. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, this is a function that we use uh, to illustrate this point. It's actually an Excel function called norm dist. And what this does, and I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't, this is probability density. What this really is, is this ends up being p-values here. And it's the probability that any of these points, uh, that any point is likely to be above or below that point. So in other words, at the peak is the greatest probability that a random person is going to be, or be uh, above or below that person. At down here, it would probably be less than 0.001, that if a random person is very unlikely to have a score lesser than this or greater than this. Does that make sense? No. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't okay. Okay. Um, okay. So it's a way of displaying the data that approximates a normal distribution and that basically says, um, so here would be the probability that... How is this different from what we would usually see, which is a histogram? Um, because so gen generally a histogram would be that this, that this is frequency. So this is still an individual person that happens to be right at the mean of central tendency. And normally in, an, in, the, in a general histogram, we would see that this is percentage or number of the subjects in that region. Yeah, but we could fit a curve to the histogram, which would be the probability. That's correct. OK. Uh, OK. Um, OK, um, so I'm sort of nearing the end, but I've got a couple of things I'd like to say. So basically, uh, bottom line is that CNVs that are characterized as incomplete penetrance still impact functioning. All right, so the, the debate in the field is also incomplete penetrance versus variable expressivity. We find that there's strong evidence for variable expressivity. That is, it's, it's very rare that when we see a proband that's, quote, unaffected, that there isn't some deleterious impact based on uh, relative to expected output on biparental mean. Um, these, the impact of the CNVs then, rather than being compared to absolute clinical thresholds, need to be compared to expected outcomes in the context of family background. Uh, some of the kind of who cares is basically to, to not have false negative reports early in development. That is, if we can find markers early on that, that might suggest that there's going to be a high risk later on, that helps. It also suggests that phenotyping the parents may be a strategy in order to sort of help parents kind of uh, have a sense of what's to be expected, what's to be predicted, although hopefully not at this some sort of you know, fatalistic loss of, of effort or energy to expend on, on um, you know, making the child learn whatever he or she can learn, obviously. Um, and we're also, this is not just limited to ASD or intellectual disability. In fact, we're, we're looking 
the whole spectrum, and we've started, and I've actually normed a measure recently looking at schizophrenia spectrum behaviors that, that also are in the general population. Um, I said earlier, you know, when we talk about social skills, you know, you can sort of say, yeah, well, I'm a little socially awkward, or I don't make great eye contact. Um, when we talk about the normal distribution of, of anxiety, people can say, well, I don't have an anxiety disorder, but I know what it's like to feel stressed. With schizophrenia, you know, rarely do you hear someone say, oh, yeah, last week I thought of Jesus Christ. Um, you know, those generally, we sort of say, well, that's a more severe manifestation. And yet there are prodromes to schizophrenia. And there are, there are uh, ways of quanti quantifying subclinical schizophrenia types of traits in terms of magical thinking, in terms of you know, uh, uh, you know, shades of paranoia, things like that, um, and that we're marking and validating, and that we've tested to measure on a, on, a, uh, on a national representative sample. And we've established heritability on these schizophrenia spectrum traits between offspring and um, so. These are, these are some of the directions, and I guess this is it, uh, is to continue using these quantitative trait measures uh, to, to map them out. They've been adopted by the Simons Group, so these are going to be incorporated in their international uh, studies where we're testing 16P families and also expanding it to families with 1Q21, um, where we're going to be phenotyping both the probands and the parents. Um, and also, I currently have... Um, an R01 submitted to look at this in, a, in, in sort of mapping profiles of the shift of the cost, of the impact of the CNV in, in uh, several different other CNVs extending to the schizophrenia spectrum again. Um, and that's, that's kind of, these are, these are some of the early, uh, the early data on a shift uh, in 22Q deletion programs who have a uh, penetrance of about 40% for schizophrenia, and we're finding that even here, there's, um, we're already seeing a shift in the children. Okay, I, th I think I'm going to end here and open it up for questions. These are just some of the colleagues and students uh, over the years who've been working on this. These are uh, some of the people from the Simons Foundation. These are the Geisinger Group, a series of students, past students, postdocs have gone on, and i um, happy to take questions. Yes. So that using the logic of the two, when you were talking about family background, uh, my immediate thought went to income, um, parent education, uh, things of that sort. Uh, but it seems like you could, the same logic uh, would apply. Um, what's your sense of how, how, if you thought about family amount of treatment, so on and so forth, uh, if you thought about it that way, um, would you come to the same sorts of conclusions or different conclusions? It's, it's a great question. So I'm, I'm, I'm currently working with a group that are um, sort of genomic fanatics. And what they, what, what they generally fall into is saying uh, there are other family background, and I actually did a sort of air parenthesis, other family genetic back background traits that, that determine the degree of expressivity. That hasn't been proven, right? So there may be many other factors that are contributing to the, to the shift around the measure of central tendency. Um, one of the things, though, that, that the logic in some of the members of the group is that what, we, what they want to do is actually, and we've got this written into one of the grants, is actually to look at other genetic background factors. In other words, just because someone has a 16P112 deletion doesn't mean that they don't have other copy number variations and that these things can kind of accumulate. And you can even come up with an index of sort of the genomic load on a family or an individual that may be responsible for that shift. But that still doesn't explain other, other factors, motivations, uh, access to resources and treatment um, that, that may be contributing to that. Uh, we're sort of taking the genomics first approach and seeing how much variance we can account for with there. And then maybe what's left over is, is a much more complex kind of contextual issue that may be going on. But it's, a, it's kind of the question I was afraid of. It's a great and it's a great question. It's something that I'm bothered by sometimes. Yes. I have some kind of follow-up. 
uh, that these CNVs have, have always been in the general population. That, that, that where we put, that where parallels, that the other group that I'm talking about would have been way under the radar a generation ago. That, that awareness has made an amazing difference. And unfortunately, what it does, anytime there's a, there's a massive increase in something, people sort of fill in the gaps with actually kind of environmental stuff, right? And so we're all familiar with the music most rubella thing and cell towers and, and anything. N you know, none of those things have been shown to contribute. So all of this is really an awareness of, of genomics, a better ability to do genetic screening cheaper. I mean, the stuff we've done here would have been millions uh, a case a couple of years ago. Now for a thousand bucks, we can get what we need. Um, and, and the rates of autism are, are increasing, I think, because the rates of awareness and understanding is, is increasing. The, the people on the front lines that I work with, that are the clinicians, often say, Parents don't want to hear that their child has They love hearing that their child has autism. There is a, there's a, almost a cachet about it. The rates of intellectual disability diagnoses have actually gone down a little bit. <laughs> and uh, we think it's sort of a trade-off of, well, if there's a social skill issue, there's a community that rallies around autism much more than, than sort of garden variety intellectual disability. Um, however, there is an intriguing hypothesis out there. And it has to do with clusters of autism. And, and these have been something that people have made a, lot of, a big stink about. Tom's River, New Jersey was one of the places where it was like, oh my gosh, there's a real spike in ASD diagnoses. What's going on? There's oil refineries around there. That's got to be it or something. Come to find out, to, as a community, they invested a lot of money in special services for autism. So people who lived in the surrounding areas mo with kids with autism moved into Tom's River, New Jersey. The rates of autism spiked because the services were better. Something similar happened in, in Silicon Valley. Um, and there's a whole other story there that's a little bit fantastical, but it's still kind of interesting, which is when you think about very high-functioning autistic kids a generation ago, uh, or two generations ago, that might have been you know, 40 years living in their parents' basement tinkering with AM radios, are, are now employed by Microsoft, and they're millionaires, and they're a lot cooler on the dating circuit than they were two generations ago. <laughs> and there's sort of a, a you know, some, some sense of people like Simon Baron Cohen, have, who's made the link between parental occupation and ASD, have sort of said, wow, that part of the country's got way more than its share of kids with high-functioning autism, and look at the parents. Uh, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and those people might not have been uh, high on the fertility circuit a couple of generations ago, and now they're millionaires and successful, and, and um, that's, I don't mean to make light of it, but, but that's been thrown out there as kind of a, how some of these CNVs may actually be changing in prevalence. But the general line is that these are, that these are stable. Another question. Please. Uh, about your first part of your presentation. Yes. Reflective behavior. Yes. So uh, it is focused on early stages of development. Do you ever thought about elderly people? Because it, I believe, from common knowledge, <laughs> common experience, that there's another spike. <laughs> it, it, that's something I had wanted to pick up about about 20 years ago, and I never did. And, and it was based on observations of my grandmother in a nursing home that could not stand variations in her daily ritual. Um, and, and also kind of the detriment in executive function that seemed to accompany it as well. Um, and I think there's really something to that. Um, I haven't looked at that, and I am, I'm not aware that anyone has looked at that. And I think that's a whole other really interesting avenue for looking at this stuff, but particularly, I think, linking it to to changes in executive function that happen, but that would be my own, my own uh, guess. But I think that's really cool. Yes. There's some heritability to the repetitive behaviors. So a really ignorant question. Is it a singular repetitive behavior, or could it exhibit different? Yeah, very good. Um, it can exhibit very different. So, if if we throw out the dimensional stuff for a second, and you look at psychiatric comorbidity, 
um, there's high rate of, of uh, penetrance into families of both Tourette's and OCD. And so there are some, there's a, a model of autosomal dominance transmission. In fact, Jim Lechman, my old mentor at Yale, was brilliant because he wrote a paper saying evidence for an autosomal dominant transmission for Tourette's syndrome that was published in the New England Journal. And then next year, evidence against an autosomal dominant transmission for Tourette's also in the New England Journal. I was like, gosh, if I could read my own stuff in those journals. But what they, what they noticed is that, um, that OCD and Tourette's pop up in the same families more often than not, and it can manifest. And even within something like OCD, some can be checkers and some can be hoarders. Um, in Tourette's, some people within a family can have more motor tics and some can have more phonic tics. So the specific, the specific behavior seems to be more variable, but the underlying kind of repetitive nature of it seems to be what's, what's kind of clustering within families. Lisa. So I have a quick question on how this happens in typical development. Um, I currently have an 18-month-old porter. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and really, she just wants to carry things around. Yeah. And so kind of bringing it back to that, so, so how, how is this, um, you know, these CNVs, are, are they just being expressed differently? Uh, do you know what I'm trying to say here? So it, is there something related to the way that um, this happens in psychiatric disorders, like what's the link between the genetics and typical behavior, like these deletions and typical behavior versus... Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean... Uh, it's not very well thought out, but it's no, just I, kind of think about what, what, what's happening in typical development that you would see these things that are normal. It's a good question. I, I, I just made up an answer if you'd like to hear it, but... Um, <laughs> But I think, you know, it, so it's possible, for example, that, that, um, that all of us, all, in fact, it's certainly the case, all of us have copy number variations. Uh -huh. M most copy number variations are of, of no consequence or totally benign, right? But one could imagine that maybe there are some copy number variations or single nucleotide polymorphisms mm -hmm. that at a certain point in development seem to manifest in behavior. Mm -hmm. And maybe it has to do with perseverative repetitive behavior that once the executive or cognitive control kind of takes over, that gets suppressed. But there isn't enough of that stuff to keep it in check. I mean, that's a possibility. But I certainly don't mean to say that sort of all all three-year-olds have a copy number variation. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it, it's, it's a good question. I, it's, a, it's a difficult one. Because then I see my mom telling me that I'm a hoarder, too. <laughs> yeah. I used to carry books. So the family thing is normal. Is there a link there, or is there something going on during typical development that is um, related to... We, we could almost certainly say this, that... that in, in fact, and, and we know this definitively, <laughs> that there's a high correlation, even as an adult, between, pardon me, but you know, your repetitive behaviors restricted and the, and the frequency, intensity, and duration of your daughters, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Those are going to be linked. Yeah. And it's a question of, of how far the shift goes and whether it crosses or not, which we're sort of saying isn't important, but, but yet, I mean, that's, that's definitely there's something to that. Great. Yes. You mentioned our doctor out the folks. Yes. Constructs and mechanisms of this. And I'm struck going uh, back to your ERP example with the line. Yes. When it was on sort of this novelty detection task yes. that we've got going on. Um, and the relevance, and if, if you're seeing future steps in your work, you need to go back into context. So, for instance, you can have a child who be <clears throat> quite good at that novelty detection, maybe yeah. a faster latency or um, heightened amplitude of the ERP, but that child might be looking for knowledge and detection in terms of internalizing things like an anxiety and what's changing in the environment, which would be very different than someone that's saying novelty detection, that is different than what I wanted, and that manifests itself in more externalizing meltdown, hyperdose, expressive behavior. So 
is there any work on this thus far that's now going from here's repetitive behaviors, ways that we can track them um, and look at you know, neural markers of it and then say, now we can link it back out to what's happening for these kids in different contexts? Yeah, no, it, it's a good question. And some of this stuff, so what's interesting is, and the, the reason we went into the repetitive, or my appeal when I made the childhood routines inventory was to limit them to observable things that the parents would be able to see. And there's a whole other level here that's the subjective stuff that is kind of into the black box that we can never know, right? Which is, you know, how preoccupied are. It's so a lot of it, so there's the repetitive behaviors, but then there's restricted interests or people who ruminate or, or you know, I mean, there is a kind of symmetry and perfectionism thoughts for some people um, where they have to say things to themselves. And these are things that are really kind of, you know, personal and subjective criteria that, that frankly, in a young kid, a young kid wouldn't even be able to really express it. Uh, there's also this interesting phenomenon in pediatric OCD, and I don't know if this bears on your question, which the, the old model, like the primacy of anxiety in that, you know, the, kind of the Freudian model of, of first there's anxiety and then these are displacement, compulsions or displacement behaviors. In pediatric OCD, the onset of the compulsions precedes the onset of reports of anxiety and intrusive thoughts by almost two years. And so it's almost like this is a motor thing. Now, there's a problem with that, which has to do with the ability or willingness to articulate, all right, in a young kid. And what am I really thinking and can I wrap my head around that? Or if it's some, you know, taboo or sexual or inappropriate or some thought that would be really difficult or embarrassing to share. So that could be all an artifact. But, but um, I think that there's two things going on and one of them is the kind of uh, objective observables and the other is the subjective distress that's brought on by these things. But I should say, and re remember that for that ERP task, we did have, a, it wasn't just um, novelty detection because we had, another t we had another task, a red sphere, blue sphere. So we sort of, we regressed that out. So we wanted to make sure that this wasn't just sensitivity to change generically, but that it was particular to this kind of symmetry phenomenon. So we, so we, we accounted for their abilities to detect difference in, the, in a different control ball task. Yes? You showed the normal distribution of IQ scores, and then you showed this place uh, to a lower region, a smaller normal distribution of scores, and you, you seem to be wondering why there should be so much variability in the small distribution. And I guess I didn't quite get the point because if you get an IQ score on a group of people or whatever, you expect variability. So, what, what is the point? Yeah, the point, uh, the point, and I may be wrong, uh, the point was, was this, that when we, when we take the old approach and say, here's kids with, with autism, and we're going to look at their distribution of behaviors, we see that there's, a, that there's tremendous heterogeneity in the clinical presentation. But then the, the logic was, if we then limit the ASD, in terms of a specific copy number variant that we know to impact behavior, one would think that that heterogeneity would be reduced because we've identified 